Hi folks, I'm Kerry Farr. Welcome to In Your Corner. Do you think it's possible for a good moral or a good Christian person to become addicted to drugs? Well, today we have a former NFL football player, Greg Gaines, on the program. Greg played in the league for 14 years. And because of injuries, he had 40 different surgeries. And after he had surgery, the doctors would prescribe prescription drugs to take care of the pain. And as a result of that, he became addicted to prescription drugs. It almost took his life. You want to stick around today and hear Greg's amazing story and how he overcame this demon of drug addiction on today's edition of In Your Corner. Well, you know, thinking back over your career, I've, I've read where you were a legend, a high school legend here <laughs> in Nashville, Tennessee, and an outstanding college football player at the University of Tennessee, and then also an outstanding uh, linebacker for the Seattle Seahawks in the NFL. There's not many people that make it to that level. You know, what was it like being an NFL football player? Well, it was a, a dream of mine ever since I was a child playing in the National Football League. So basically what it did was fulfill my dreams and my hopes as, as a youngster. And I got that from my uncle. He, he was Ray Odom, and he played at MTSU. Uh, Ray played for 10 years for the Colts and uh, ended up with Detroit. And so I, I saw firsthand what the professional lifestyle was. And it's something that I was very interested in and wanted to do. That's all I remember wanting to do as a child. And, of course, in, you know, it's been, what, uh, 20 years since you broke into the league? Uh, maybe 30 years since you were in the league? 1981 was my first year. First year. Mm -hmm. And so you guys didn't make the kind of money in those days that they're making today, did you? Absolutely not. And, uh, but, you know, I, that's like you and I discussed earlier. I wouldn't change a thing. It is what it is. Salaries escalate, uh, you know, you have a lot of variables and reasons why that happens. Uh, you know, of course, free agency is Valerie's taken off. And I am proud of the fact that we went through two strikes as a player. Uh, I'm not a big union guy, but I do believe that there is a place for unions. Uh, if there's some type of uh, oppressive action that's being, you know, forced on, them, on the players by management. Mm -hmm. Greg, what are some of the highlights of, of, of your football career, I, I guess throughout your entire football career? Well, I would say the biggest one is in 1983, uh, Chuck Knox, very first year there, we went to the AFC Championship game, and uh, we lost to the Raiders down in L.A. at the Coliseum, and I mean, we were one game away from the Super Bowl, and I don't think, we were such a young team, I don't think we realized how close we were you know, I mean, that was my third year in the league at the time, and I was starting. And, but I just didn't understand how hard it is to get to that point because we never got to the championship game again. We were a perennial playoff team throughout the 80s. We were a very good football team. Seemed like every uh, Sunday we were playing on TV uh, back here, and people would tell me that our game was on, and people enjoyed watching us play, uh, but, but never got back to the championship game. And so at the time, I was too young to understand, and I'm sure a lot of my teammates were, how close we were to achieving something that is very difficult to do. So uh, that, that's the highlight, without a doubt. Uh, I would say probably playing up at UT, too, also ranks up there. I had a great experience there, and that's where I met my wife. She's a cheerleader, so it's one of these little fairy tale stories that, <laughs> you know, that you can write up, and it's, and 29 years later, we're still hanging in there, and and uh, do what we got to do. So, star football player marries marries UT cheerleader. <laughs> it's just perfect headlines. But she's my baby, and uh, so we've been very fortunate. And that's something. Now, uh, what does it take if, if if some young man is watching that has aspirations of playing in the league, the NFL? What does it take? And of course, I realize you got to have talent, size, and speed. But aside from that, what does it take to make it into the NFL? 
Well, I, I think there's, number one, you got to go to the right team. It, uh, let's just say if you're not drafted and you're a free agent and you got to do it the hard way, you got to go to the right team, first of all. Uh, you got to have the talent. But more than anything, you got to have uh, something inside of you that just burns. And it's, it's, a, it's a feeling that is very difficult to explain. You almost have to be there to understand it. But you just, it, it just has to burn. And it's something that you can't put out until you accomplish it or succeed. And uh, that's the type of attitude that you have to have is that you're not going to conform and you're not going to do things the way that the veterans tell you to do. You're out there for yourself. And uh, as far as, I'm not taking away from the team, but as far as making the football team or to make an impression, that's what you got to do, man. You got to play very hard and you got to go all out every play. Mm -hmm. And then you have a chance. If you don't do that, you, you don't have much of a chance. Well, you know, those guys in the NFL are so big, so fast, and you being, uh, you know, pl playing linebacker, which is a, a position where you're hitting somebody almost on every play, you end up with a lot of injuries. Well, you do, but the thing about my situation, I was a safety in college, and they moved me to linebacker my very first year there, the rookie year, and so I was kind of learning on the run, but they saw something in me that they liked. And uh, what that was is just a phenomenal amount of effort, and I learned the position really quickly. And it was that's difficult to do, play safety in college and then go to linebacker and learn on the run. Yeah. But it's something I had to do. So I did what I had to do to survive. And uh, quite interesting, I've had tons of surgeries. You and I discussed this earlier. Uh, I've had 40 operations, orthopedic Forty wise. operations, mm -hmm. my goodness. And it's, it's one of those deals that, uh, you asked me earlier when you and I were talking if I would change anything, and I wouldn't. I think that's what makes a person, um, it's, I don't want to say their identity, but it is just part, it's a piece of life that has happened. It's me, and so you deal with it, and you just move on. You know? Well, now, subsequently from having all of these surgeries, you had a lot of pain in your body, and you started taking medications to you know, obviously overcome the pain, and what happened as a result of that? Well, I ended up getting addicted to pain medication, and what would happen is I'd get off of it and do extremely well, and then I, had to, I would have to have another operation, and every time that I would get cleaned up or cleaned out or get off the medication, another surgery would come. And invariably, every time the doctors give you strong narcotics, in the operating room, when you're out of the operating room, that cycle will just kind of start back mm. over. And it wasn't by choice, it was by basic necessity at first, and then it just turned out to, you know, to be a full-blown addiction. And there's not really a pretty way to paint it. It's ugly, and it is what it is, and so that's something that's been very difficult for me and my family. But we've hung in there, and, um, you know, we've turned this thing over to God, yes. and God is in control, and that's kind of what I've been trying to do is bring some awareness about addiction to especially people of faith. A lot of times they don't have much of an understanding of this thing, and judgment can be passed really quickly yes. a lot of times. And that's one thing that I, you know, I feel like that, that churches really need to be careful of is snap quick judgment and categorizing people and putting them in a group. Yes. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of good people that have uh, had some addiction problems, but they've walked out of it and they've gone on and become very productive and good people. And, you know, Betty Ford Center, I mean, yes. we're talking about the president's wife, we're talking about John McCain's wife, who ran for president, had an addiction to painkillers. And there's been a lot of people, John Kennedy, they say, was addicted to pain medicine. Uh, so we're talking about a lot of very influential people that have had some problems, and there just has not been enough awareness, I don't think, out there. Um, and I'm talking to physicians. I'm talking to whoever may be involved. A lot of times you have unscrupulous physicians that aren't doing, they're not helping their patients if they continue to be a legal drug dealer mm. for these people. And uh, listen, man, my wife's had to tell every doctor that I've dealt with and deal with, have dealt with in the past is that you cannot give this guy pain medicine because when I have it in my hand, it's not, you know, it's, it's just a place I don't want to go. 
Right. It, it's very, very hard, very difficult, and it's just not because I know that it's going to give me that relief, you know, that, that I really enjoy as far as not being in pain or not having any physical ailments, and it'll allow me to go work out and do those type of things that, uh, that I really enjoy doing. Folks, we'll be back in just a moment with our special guest. And if you want to know more about his story, go to inyourcorner.tv. Something's not right. I'm failing. Screwed up. Alone. Fear is killing me. I need a way out. The emptiness we feel is real. Our decisions, our sins, have separated us from God. It's like a wall. But what you need to know is that there is a way. To remove the wall and find forgiveness. Hope. Freedom. Put your trust in God's Son, Jesus Christ. Turn it all over to Him. Find some peace. He died to set us free from sin. He suffered and died for you. That's how much Jesus loves us. Call 888-NEED-HIM or visit needhim.org. Learn how Jesus can tear down the wall, separating you from God. It's not about church or religion. It's about a relationship. One you need. Now and forever. Please call 888-NEED-HIM right now. We aren't meant to do this alone. Folks, we're back with former NFL football star Greg Gaines. And Greg, we were talking about before the break that even as a Christian or somebody, a person of faith, if you've had operations and, you know, they give you narcotics uh, to overcome the pain, oftentimes good people get addicted to narcotics. Well, a lot of times it's out of control as far as it being a biological, you know, it, this can be a biological thing. In my case, it is. Uh, I had two grandfathers that were very, very bad alcoholics, just the worst. And uh, uh, my parents really didn't know them. I'm talking about the kind of al alcoholics that would come in and shoot a house up with a gun, mm. that type of thing. And so, uh, you know, they had a very difficult childhood. And it can, you know, this gene can skip a generation. And so one of the messages that I've been telling young kids especially is that be very careful because if you have that gene, the first time that you take some type of mind-altering substance, whether it be a narcotic or a drink, just, just something explodes. It's different than it is for a normal person. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that will scoff at that. This science. I mean, this is, this is proven science. And... Um, addiction is very difficult as far as getting things right, and, and there's just different degrees and levels of it, and so it, it's something that needs to be discussed a little more, I feel like, especially with young kids. My message is really simple as this. If you're a, a child or a teenager, or just don't take that first one, and you don't risk, you know, the possibility of having that genetic disorder where addiction, you know, has played in the family role in the past. Yeah. So you're saying scientifically that there are some people that have addictive personalities and it might only take one toke of a joint or one drink uh, of a bottle of beer or whatever to get them hooked. That's, that's what I'm saying. And I think that my behavior is, you know, it's an obsessive compulsive type behavior in that if it's work, I'm going to do it just all out. I mean, there's, I work 15, 16, 17 hours a day, I, and that's what I used to do uh, yeah. after I played. Uh, and it's a grind, but you love it. You right. Know, you, you just absolutely love it. And uh, so if it's not work, it's coffee. You know, I'd just drink more coffee than anybody else. It's, else if it's not coffee, it might be water. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's just outdoing. You know, it, it's very difficult. The mentality is hard to explain. But people that have this type of disorder, th they understand it. They, sure. they can understand exactly what I'm talking about. Right. And here you are, a former NFL football star that's been addicted to prescription drugs. How are you dealing with it on a daily basis? And if somebody else is, you know, trying to get across the river, so to speak, and leave that on the other side, how can you help them today overcome some of these addictions? Well, I don't think it's I can help them. I think it's something that God has to do. And, uh, you know, the, you have all these groups out here in Al-Anon, and you have these people that, that give you advice and, and your parents and this and that. And the bottom line is, you know, when God calls you, 
you need to listen, and you need to, you know, it needs to be followed up with some type of corresponding action, and, and that takes you to do. Action, not sitting. You well, it take, it, that's exactly right. It takes some type of action on your part, not somebody picking you up and taking you to a treatment facility, but you understanding that I have to do this for me, and I'm going to go to a treatment facility to get better, and it's not pressure from parents, it's not pressure from your uh, brothers or your sisters or anybody else or employer. You know, it's, I want to do this for me, I want to get better so I can be a blessing to those that I'm around and, uh, you know, them not having to worry about me falling asleep at the table. Right. You know, and oftentimes we see people that have addictive uh, behaviors and, and feel like they don't need help. What is the benefit of someone going to a treatment center? Well, I think it, it's an educational experience, that's for sure. I mean, you learn all about uh, addiction. Uh, there is a 12-step program, but there's also a Christian 12-step program also that is Christ-centered, and that's what I prefer. Uh, you know, the bottom line is this. You have to surrender to yourself, and you've got to turn everything over to God. And uh, God is the only thing that has kept me alive up to this point. Friend, I can promise you, um, I've had a lot of close calls, and we're talking about a lot of overdoses. Near, near knew, death, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it's not nothing I'm pr proud of, uh, but it's, like I said, it makes up who I am, and my past is, is a part of who I am. Now, what the devil or Satan wants to do is he wants you to live in the sin instead of live in God. So he wants you to dwell on all these type of things that you've done in the past and make you think there is no future, and that's just a lie. That's the father of lies talking to you, and you cannot fall for that, uh, and I, I refuse to. Now, does that mean I've been perfect and have not uh, messed up? No, I have, okay? I'll be the first to tell you, and that's one thing that I refuse to do is not be honest uh, in this thing because it's a difficult road. But I also know that there's freedom on uh, when, when you're doing the right thing and you're allowing God to run your life. When you're honest, does that help you overcome this? I mean, if you're telling people, you know, what you're dealing with and things like that? Well, you have to be honest. If there's not a degree of honesty, you're just wasting your time. You're wasting everybody else's time. And so that's the way I've chosen to approach this thing is that you don't think you can have a problem? Well... You know, play with it and find out, okay? Yeah. It'll take you places you never wanted to go, never, never thought you would go, and, and that's what it's done for me, and it's robbed me of who Greg really is. And I know who Greg is yeah. today, and that is a very uh, free feeling. There's freedom in that, but there's a lot of people that choose to live in fairy tale land yeah. and don't want to address issues and, or sweep it under the carpet. And these type of things happen in churches. You know, there, there's things that happen in a church. It's a church, I always say, is for the sick. Yeah. If you're not sick, there's no reason to go in there. Everybody who goes to church on Sunday needs, um, you know, needs cleansing and needs, yes. needs that shot of antibiotics that only you can get at a church. So that's, that's your support group, I guess. Oh, well, that's my support group. And I believe in AA and NA and all those type things are great. And I'm certainly not denouncing those. I think they're very important. But, uh, but for me, I was raised in the church, and faith is everything. Yeah. It's the only thing that's kept me alive. Now, I know that, and it's the only thing that's kept me from saying, oh, what the heck? You know, I had a, a first cousin that was two or three years younger than me that that first overdosed at 16 years of age and was almost dead in the hospital when he was just a teenager. And he repeated this process throughout his life. And then when he was about 40, he overdosed on heroin and died. And I don't remember him ever going and, you know, being honest and getting the type of counseling. So in your estimation, this is very important for recovery, getting help. Oh, abs well, I, I don't think there's any shame in that. Yeah. And see, see, a lot of people, uh, they feel timid and shameful. And what I'm saying is there's no reason to be timid. There's no, there's no reason to be shameful. You know, addiction is a, alive and it's real and it's well out there. And it's getting worse every day. 
Yeah. Especially with the internet age and the information age, and all you got to do is punch a button. And it used to be you could order stuff over the internet. I don't know if you can still now, but uh, I think they've done some things to stop all that type of misuse. But um, I just know that drugs are in our high schools, and they're and they're so accessible. And children know this. If they're listening to me now, or if they're in high school, they know that you can get something out of a medicine bottle that your parents may have at high school, and it's killing kids. Kids yeah. are dying because of this. And I've seen overdoses where kids aren't as fortunate as me, you know, for whatever reason. You know, maybe I've got a, just an unreal tolerance to this type of thing, but kids die from this, man. Yeah. You know, and it's happening on a regular basis. Mm. Greg Gaines, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you so much. In your corner My today. friend Kerry. Okay, appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. When Jesus Christ was physically on earth, before he left, he gave his disciples many clues as to when he would return. He also told them he was going away, but he was coming back to collect believers and take them to a place called heaven. These clues that he left are called prophecies. Many people don't believe in Bible prophecy, but they are absolutely true. Recently, we sat down with Dr. Jimmy DeYoung, one of America's foremost biblical prophecy teachers. He talked about four trends or four clues that Jesus left that are actually happening today that point to his soon return. I want to send you a copy of that interview we did with Dr. Jimmy DeYoung. All you have to do is send a donation of any size, any amount to P.O. Box 218-425, Nashville, Tennessee, 37221, or you can even go to our website, inyourcorner.tv, and make a donation of any size, and we'll send this out to you right away. Thank you for watching In Your Corner. My daughter Katie, when she was a little girl, came to me once after she had had a party and she said, Mom, um, everybody that comes to our house wants to be part of our family. And I used to love that because family is what it's all about. And then a couple years later I got divorced and I realized that I would never be a family again and that broke my heart. And when anyone would talk about families or broken in church about broken families, I would feel like crying inside knowing I'd never be a family again. And then my daughter Jackie had a 20th birthday party a couple years later and 60 some people came over to the house. Most of them were out on the patio and outside and I was sitting inside with some of her girlfriends. Her friend BJ came in the house and he had started coming over to the house all by himself if he wanted even if Jackie wasn't there. He walked to the refrigerator, opened the door and he was looking for food. Kelly, her, Jackie's friend was sitting by me and she said, BJ, you think you're like family? And he turned around and said, Kelly, I am family and in that instant I got it you build your family you make your family family is who you gather with where Jesus is at the head of it family it doesn't necessarily mean a mom and dad and with the wor w world the way it is now you you build your family wherever you go I've moved around and I've made people my family and once I realize that I realize that family comes from the heart it's Jesus sitting at the table with, the, with all of us and leading us and us gathering and doing life together. I do work with the homeless and I brought meals down to them in styrofoam containers down by the riverbank one day. And there were nine of them there and one said to me, can I get one for Carl? He's sleeping. I promise I'll give it to him. And I said, that's okay. You know, I'll leave one for you. I, I'll give it to him. He was worried about his brother. His brother on the street that had become family. They sat there. And as I was driving away, I looked at eight of them wide awake, sitting there with their, their styrofoam containers, eating and talking. And I thought, you know what? That's family. That's the real deal. And then I drove through town, and I drove through the, past the really, really big houses. And I thought, you know what? Most of the people in those houses, the kids have their, their video games. They have their computers. They're texting during meals. And I thought, you know what? They're living in big homes alone together that isn't family. We have to redefine what family is. Family is wherever you're at. It's the people in your life. So the people that you, you get close to, that you get to know, start developing that relationship with them. Sit Jesus down at the head of the table and build your family. And you know what? You're real family. You're the kind that you can call in the middle of the night and they'll be there. 
Remember, Jesus is the head of the, head of the family, the silent listener of every conversation, the unseen guest at every table. In 2001, folks, I was so discouraged, I was so despondent, I was so depressed that I actually contemplated suicide. You see, I just lost my first wife, Diane, to cancer. She'd been my childhood sweetheart. We'd been together for 30 years. We'd raised a family. And here I was, all alone, after she died. I was so discouraged that I got in my car and I drove to Florida. And while I was in Florida, I was crossing this large bridge. It's called the Skyway Bridge, just south of Tampa, Florida. And there are more suicides on this bridge than almost anywhere else in America. And as I neared the top of this bridge in my car, a voice said to me, stop the car and jump to your death. And I believe there is a spirit of death on that bridge in other places too. Maybe there's one speaking to you, asking you to throw in a towel, to quit, to chuck it all, to commit suicide. And just like me, if you've heard that voice, immediately after I heard that voice, I heard another voice say to me, don't quit. Your daughter Christy and your granddaughter Cameron are still alive and they need you. And I felt like I was nothing. I felt so insignificant that I just wanted to quit. But the fact that I heard that voice and realized that my daughter and my granddaughter still needed me, that gave me the strength to carry on. And friend, I don't care what you're going through today. I want you to know that God still has a plan and a purpose for your life. You're needed. Somebody once said, you may not be somebody in this world, but to somebody, you are the world. You see, that daughter and that granddaughter needed me, and I was the world to them. And that gave me the strength to carry on. And somebody needs you, dear friend. So no matter what you're going through, don't give up. I want you to know that there's a brighter day and that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And if we can help you at all, you contact us at inyourcorner.tv and we'll do what we can. We'll pray with you, send you literature, do what we can to help you. Folks, thanks for watching today's edition of In Your Corner. If any of this has been a help to you and you need more information, please feel free to go to our website, inyourcorner.tv. TV. See you again, same time, same channel, next week.